So as the last video in our examination of energy, work, power, all that good stuff, we're going to be dealing with uh, some practice problems. Uh, the first of which we have drawn out right here. Basically you start with a mass, that is some height h above a spring with spring constant k, and it compresses this distance d until uh, the mass stops and eventually the spring will push it back up and it will oscillate back and forth. But what we want to figure out is how large is this distance d in terms of m, h, k, and other constants. Basically how large is d in terms of the mass, how high you drop it, all these variables that it is uh, dependent on. So because this is a conservative force we start off by saying that ke1 plus u1 equals Ke2 plus U2. So we know that at the end of the problem it's not moving so we can eliminate this Ke2 term and at the beginning it's also not moving. You're dropping it from uh, rest basically. So we have that U1 equals U2 but they're different types of potential energy. Here we have uh, you know MGH your gravitational potential energy, and here it's all stored in this coil, your uh, Hooke's law, the elastic potential energy. So what we have to do is write out the force times the distance to get the work, and the, the height from which uh, it uses all its energy. You can't just use H as the total height because it gains some kinetic energy when it's going from H through this distance, D, to pause. So the total uh, energy released via gravity is actually h is mg times h plus d. And then all you have to do is set that equal to uh, the distance or the spring constant times the distance that it compresses squared all over 2. From here uh, we can distribute the mg in and move it all over to one side and we get that 0 equals kd squared over 2 minus mgh minus mgd. Now because uh, we have a polynomial with a d squared term, a d term, and no d term right here, we can basically just use the uh, quadratic formula. You know the x equals b squared plus or, or negative b plus or minus uh, root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. We just plug that in. So in this case we have negative b is uh, mg plus, because we're looking for the maximum compression not the minimum one, uh, plus your mg squared, because that's b squared, minus 4 times negative mgh, so we take that negative and make that a positive, mgh times the uh, k, k over 2 term. Oh, that's a poorly drawn k over 2. There we go. All right. And put that all over the leading constant which is, once again, uh, k over 2. So this all is multiplied by 2, and here is the k. And that is our final equation for the distance of the compression of the spring. All right, so now we're going to look at a different problem in which we have some sort of ramp with some angle theta and a block being pulled up by some tension some distance, delta x, but its uh, motion is being slowed down by this uh, frictional force with coefficient of friction nu k. And what we want to know is the work done by the normal force, the frictional force, the tension, what is the net work done, and what is the total change in mechanical energy, if there is any. So we'll start off by looking at the work done by the normal force. And so we know that uh, work is force times distance times the cosine of the angle between them. We'll call that phi. Well, it's moving this way, and the normal force acts perpendicular. And we know that cosine of 90 degrees is zero. Therefore, 
uh, the normal force does zero joules of work. Now what about the frictional force? Well, the frictional force, once again we set up with work equals force times delta x times the cosine phi between them. Well the frictional force this time operates anti-parallel to the direction of motion. So the cosine of or the angle between them is 180 and we know that cosine of 180 is negative 1. So we get that the work done is the force times or is the opposite of the force times the distance and we know that the frictional force is just mu k times the normal force times x. But we have a substitution for the normal force from our previous videos. We know that in these ramp occasions, normal force is mg cosine theta. So the work done by the frictional force is therefore mu k times mg cosine of theta times its total change in position. Moving on now, we look at the work done by the tension. And the tension, if we set up the same equation, uh, has a phi of, because it acts in the same direction, zero degrees, which means that this all equals one. So we know that uh, the work will be equal to the force times the distance traveled, but we can't just use this force because we don't uh, necessarily know what that force is. So we have to solve for the tension force using our standard tools that we have for looking at forces. In this case, uh, that means NFBD. And we'll once again break up the gravity into its constituent down ramp and parallel to ramp components mg cosine of theta and mg sine of theta. Then, looking at the sum of the forces along the ramp, we get that the tension minus the friction which we know is mu k times mg cosine theta, mu k mg cosine theta, minus this down ramp component, so mg sine of theta. And the sum of the forces perpendicular, we know that the normal force equals mg cosine of theta, because it's not accelerating at all in this direction. Therefore, the forces must be balanced in that dimension. Now, all we have to do is move these over because we know that it's not accelerating. We have this block moving at constant velocity. So we know that the tension is basically flipping the signs through algebra. We know that the tension in the string is mu k times mg cosine theta plus mg sine of theta. So all we have to do is multiply that by the distance to get the work done by the tension. Now having solved for those two, we look for the net force, or the network rather, and we know that the network is equal to the change in kinetic energy. But because this is traveling at constant velocity, that means it's kinetic energy, mv squared 0 over 2 equals mv squared 0 over 2, and then if you were to subtract the 2, you get the total change in kinetic energy is 0. Now the total change in mechanical energy, don't let that trick you, because though we've added no kinetic energy, we have moved this, you know, slightly uphill against the force of gravity. So we have to determine, you know, basically the force times the dot product. So the, uh, work done by gravity is force dotted with the distance traveled or force times delta x times the cosine of theta. Now we know that the the force we've been working against has been gravity and the delta x instead of doing this delta x cosine theta uh, we can instead translate into that component right here and it's basically as though we took the block straight up against the force mg. So we'll just say that uh, we traveled against the force mg times uh, delta x times the sine of theta because we went upwards. 
Now the last prog practice problem we're going to be doing will be uh, analyzing energy diagrams. So, oh, that should have an arrow on it. Uh, we're going to be looking at this energy diagram and basically analyzing all these different points. So we're going to be looking for, first things first, the equilibria. And we're going to be categorizing each of these points into, you know, if it is an equilibria, first of all. Uh, and then whether or not it is stable, unstable, or neutral. Next, we're going to look for what the max speed is, where there is no speed happening, and where is the force negative. So we'll start off with A as our origin, moving uh, this way. So we have U of X and X. X is positive going this way. So first we have to identify the equilibria. And if you want to do that on your own, uh, I recommend you pause the video and then categorize them into these. And then I'll go over them once you're done. Okay, so having done that, uh, we can now say that uh, the equilibria are D and H. You know, there's C, E, F, and G as well. Let me just squeeze that in there. But we have to categorize these. So we look for equilibria that are sitting in troughs, basically. The equilibria, these are all equilibria, in case you didn't know, because the slope at that point is zero. It's parallel to this x-axis. There's no force acting on it. Therefore, if you were to just place it there, it would uh, remain stable or it would remain uh, sedentary. But stable equilibria, we now have to look for things in troughs. So if they were slightly disturbed, they would return to their home point. And the only two that follow that behavior are D and H. Now the unstable equilibria were uh, those that, if disturbed, would deviate from their path. So C, if you were to nudge it slightly to the left, would come back down and roll all the way into D's trough. Likewise, E, if you were to roll it either way, would uh, fall off to either side and never return. G is precariously perched on the edge of H's trough. So, we can add all these. We get that uh, C, E, and G are all e unstable equilibria. Now, F is uh, a neutral equilibria because if you were to push it to either side, it would roll with constant velocity for a certain amount of time. Now, where does the maximum velocity occur? Well, because uh, we have this total amount of mechanical energy the whole time, and because the potential energy increases as we go up the graph, we know that at A and J, it's all potential energy. So if we were to draw you know, a pie chart, this would all be potential. Oppositely, down here, because you're much farther down on the graph, this would all be kinetic energy. Therefore, uh, it's going its greatest speed when it reaches D, the lowest point on the graph, and H is a close second. If you put H, don't worry about it. Now, where is it going zero speed? Well, like I just explained, it's going to be going zero speed where there is no kinetic energy, where it's all potential. So in that case, it's going with no velocity at points A and J. Lastly, um, where is the force negative? Remember that force is the opposite of the derivative of... Uh, the potential energy function. So wherever, and because the derivative is basically the slope, wherever there is a slope, the force, wherever there's a positive slope, the force is going to be negative. So from D and E, we can see there's a positive slope, so D through E. And then there's once again a positive slope at H all the way, ending with our last point at J. Really, it goes through the end of the graph, but we're going to use J as our last reference point. So that concludes our coverage of work and energy. Thank you very much. In the next chapter, we're going to be covering linear momentum and center of mass.